In the towering Himalayas, between South Asia and China, Tibet has always been in the eyes of the world a legendary kingdom of peace and tranquility. Its people deeply attached to their religion and their way of life. Their creed, one of tolerance, respect for the individual, love of animals and nature, belief in the spiritual equality of all human beings. A land that is rich, not in gold or earthly wealth, but in the soul of its people, where ritual and prayer mark all aspects of daily life and labor, where evil spirits are feared as symbols of the evil in man, where benign deities are revered as incarnations of man's own capacity for love and compassion. A land with a simple economy, with a limited trade with India and China, enough to satisfy the wants of a sturdy, independent people. Near Lhasa, the capital, stands the Potala, main shrine of Lamaistic Buddhism, repository of religious scriptures and treasures, an architectural masterpiece for the Asian world. Founder of the Tibetan religion in the 6th century was the Indian teacher Padma Sambhava. Revered by his people as a divine incarnation and ruler of Tibet is the Dalai Lama. Born 23 years ago, the present Dalai Lama has the loyalty of 3 million Tibetans. In addition, 8 million people in Mongolia, Manchuria, China, Turkestan, Nepal, Sikkim and Bhutan are followers of Lamaism in one form or another and have close ties with the people of Tibet. Lamaism in Tibet is part of the great world of Buddhism. 500 million people throughout Asia who follow the teachings of the Gautama Buddha. Twenty-five hundred years ago, he taught a philosophy of love and compassion, which became a civilizing influence on mankind. He taught men to free themselves of unworthy passions, of greed and conquest. In 1950, Tibet was occupied by the armies of communist China, ending a long period of Tibetan self-rule. Greedy for conquest, the communists wanted mastery over the land and soul of Tibet. The Dalai Lama was brought to Peiping, along with the Panchen Lama, who is regarded as a divine incarnation, second only to the Dalai Lama. Communist China had promised to respect Tibet's religious institutions and its right to local self-rule. In 1955, at the Bandung Conference, the pledge to Tibet seemed strengthened as Communist China's Premier, Chou Enlai, joined in the declaration of the five principles of peaceful coexistence between nations. More specifically, Communist China had, the previous year, come to a solemn agreement with India regarding the status of Tibet. At Bandung, the nations of Asia and Africa declared that imperialism had no place in the modern world. Nations and people were to be free. The next year, in 1956, the Dalai Lama was allowed to travel to India. He was received with great respect by the leaders of India and Premier Unu of Burma. He had come to attend the celebration of the 2500th anniversary of the birth of the founder of the Buddhist religion. For several months, he was India's honored guest, a spiritual leader of the Buddhist world, widely respected by leaders of all faiths. In allowing both the Dalai Lama and the Panchen Lama to take part in this memorable anniversary of the Buddhist faith, 
Communist China seemed intent on impressing the world with its tolerance of a religious ideal so contrary to its own doctrine of violence and materialism. But in Tibet itself, the communists were gradually imposing their will, breaking their pledge to respect local government and customs. In the Chinese provinces bordering Tibet, the communists had begun to impose the dreaded commune system with its slave labor, breakup of families, economic hardships, repression of religious worship. Tibetan minorities in these areas revolted and warned their countrymen across the border. It seemed only a matter of time before the communists imposed the cruel system in Tibet. In March 1959, they made the threatening moves against the Dalai Lama. The rebellion exploded full force. Lhasa, under communist bombardment, the Dalai Lama fled to India. Against the communists' reign of terror, Tibetans took up arms. It was a cry for liberty. There was indignation in India and throughout Asia. To the rallying cry of hands off Tibet, crowds demonstrated in front of the embassies of communist China, while government leaders and newspaper editorials spoke of Tibet as the Hungary of Asia, an example of aggression and imperialism against a defenseless people. The news of the Dalai Lama's escape and the continued resistance of the Tibetan people brought jubilation mixed with anxiety. Tibetans in New Delhi, led by Silen Longkongwa, a former prime minister of Tibet who fled communist rule in 1956, prayed at the Samadhi of Mahatma Gandhi, the apostle of Indian independence, the great leader who became a universal symbol of liberty and brotherhood. In this hour of trial, freedom-loving people everywhere felt as one with the Tibetan people, sharing their belief in the justice of their cause. One month after fleeing his capital, eluding communist search parties in an arduous journey through Himalayan mountain passes, the Dalai Lama with his family and 90 of his closest followers reached Indian soil. Indian government officials and press representatives from around the world witnessed his arrival in Tezpur in the state of Assam. The Dalai Lama declared that his escape would not have been possible without the loyal support of his people. People of goodwill everywhere rejoiced in his safety. The Dalai Lama expressed his gratitude to the Indian government for its grant of asylum and hospitality. The Dalai Lama accused the communists of interfering in his country's religious affairs, destroying monasteries in Kham province, using Tibetans as forced labor. He cited mass protests by his people and subsequent repressions. In Tezpur, the world saw in the gentle countenance of the Dalai Lama the image of a leader whose efforts at conciliation had met with brutal contempt by communist China. In India, he was received with added respect and reverence. The Buddha's ideals of love and compassion are under attack. But people will not surrender their soul. Our thoughts go out to the people of Tibet in their continuing struggle. To them we speak with the words of a great poet. There is not a breathing of the common wind that will forget thee. Thou hast great allies. Thy friends are exultations, agonies, and love, and man's unconquerable mind.